Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Essential Substance Abuse Skill, Skills webinar series. I'm Lena, and today we've invited Matt Ignacio to speak on group counseling. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. We are one of the four national focus centers serving the ATTC network, which also includes 10 regional centers and a network coordinating office. To learn more, please visit our website. This series is designed to be a broad overview to us in preparing for written alcohol and drug certification examinations to enhance existing knowledge and to improve overall competence and treatment outcomes. Please be aware that this series is not meant to stand alone and previous education and training is necessary in order to pass alcohol and drug certification exams. Please check out our other upcoming webinars in this series, as well as our American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health Series, which takes place on the first Wednesday of each month. We always welcome suggestions, topics, or speakers, so feel free to make suggestions either in the Q&A pod or by contacting Kate Trams at the email address or phone number provided on the slide. Our center is a NADAC certified educational provider and CEHs are available on request for a $15 fee. A request form is available for download in the files pod in the webinar screen, and I will also be sending this form in a follow-up email to all who attended. Immediately following today's webinar, you will be redirected to our GIPRA evaluation. GIPRA stands for the Government Performance and Results Act and SAMHSA asked us to evaluate our events in order to comply with this act and provide improved performance assessment and accountability. This survey asks about your satisfaction with the event and will take less than 10 minutes to complete. We thank you in advance for helping us to improve our programs. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar, so if you have questions about the presentation or about the Adobe Connect system, Please use the Q&A pod by typing your questions in the field at the bottom. We will address questions at appropriate points during the presentation. We would also like you to be aware that this webinar records participant attention time. If you minimize the webinar or are working in another window, the system will record your participation as inactive, which may be reflected in the number of CEHs received. Today's webinar is presented by Matt Ignacio. Thank you so much for joining us today, Matt, and I'll pass things over to you at this time. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, if you have problems uh, with the volume, let me know, and we'll make adjustments accordingly. Um, I am Matt Ignacio. I'm a member of the Tahana Autumn Tribe, and I am currently in school, graduate school, at the University of Washington in Seattle at School of Social Work. Um, I have about a 15, 16 year experience in HIV prevention with Indian, in Indian country and Native communities. Um, and through that experience and through training um, during my master's program, and yeah, work experience, I've had to run groups. And I've also thought about what what is the difference between running groups with non-native participants and running groups with native participants, because I've done both. And they are different to some degree. And so what I will present is some broad information, a broad overview of what group counseling is. And then we'll talk about how we can um, adapt our efforts or tailor our efforts to sound technical um, so that we can best engage and um, affirm and connect with uh, native participants um, in group work. So it's one, it's one of my favorite topics, I think. I, I like talking about group counseling. I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen if you are conducting groups or have conducted groups, um, amazing transformation and be a witness to seeing that is probably one of one of the greatest joys of the work in the work that we do. Okay, so with that, let me let me just get situated here. 
bear with me. Also, if you have questions, please feel free to type them, as Lena said, in the Q&A box as we move forward. Um, and I'll, again, as Lena said, answer them at appropriate points throughout the presentation this morning. All right, so let's look at the how-to. Let's look at the different broad overview of different types of groups um, you may be currently um, conducting or you are maybe doing in the, in the near future. First off is psychoeducational groups. And the purpose really here is to expand client awareness of, beha of their behaviors and consequences and to assist them in motivating um, you know, their behaviors and their efforts towards change. Uh, it's often used to address substance use and other problematic behaviors. So psychoeducational in and of itself is, is sort of kind of self-descriptive. There's an educational component to it. There's reflection involved in this on behalf of the participants. Um, there's discussion around what it might look like adopting a new behavior and sort of processing what life would be like adopting a new behavior. Um, the next type of group is skills development. And really the purpose here is to cultivate skills um, people will need to achieve, achieve and maintain abstinence and certainly operates from a cognitive behavioral orientation. Furthermore, cognitive behavioral groups is where the leader focuses on providing a structured environment within which group members can examine their behaviors, thoughts, and beliefs that might lead to their maladaptive or their problematic or, in quotes, their bad behavior. It's an opportunity for them to think about and, and learn um, in a structured environment. And support groups. Um, we're very, we hear this a lot in popular culture. Support groups really are, is the origins in the self-help tradition. Uh, we, there is an opportunity to offer social support, um, mutual so social support, I might add, unconditional acceptance, inward reflection, especially useful for folks who might be a little fearful or new to groups. Um, it's a place where we might call it a safe environment or a safe holding environment and help, you know, to de destigmatize a problem or activity. Um, you know, you might see this around grief, grief and loss groups. For example, individuals might be fearful of doing group work, especially if they've never um, have done that in the past, but they might you know, benefit from seeing others who are in a similar situation with grief and loss issues. And so just being in that environment for them often helps normalize the fact that they're, what they're going through, you know, that they're not alone. All right, so let's talk about group membership. So who's going to be in our groups? We can have either a fixed or revolving membership uh, process. Um, which is often referred to as either having an open group or a closed group. Open groups, you know, new members enter group when they're ready. Um, closed groups, group begins and ends with the same membership. So for closed format, the first three, if it's a 12 session group, the first three might be open. People can filter in and filter out. But by the fourth group, it's closed. So people have made the decision to stay and commit to the duration of the group. Obviously, there are pros and cons with each um, modality, um, and you can see the pros and cons listed on the slide. For open group, for example, a pro is there are dynamics with new members. If you have a group that's open, you know, by group number seven, there might be new people in there that weren't, there might be a brand new group than there was at group at the first meeting. And a pro for closed groups is that, well, by the fourth group, you have a solid set of individuals that there's group cohesion forming and that if it's the same group at group four and the same group at group five and group six and group seven, you're, there's relationships that are being built and connections are being formed. And that's a pro. Before placing a client in a particular group, um, you know, there are things that we as providers often have to consider. First and foremost, the client's readiness. Um, you know, that can either take place in a discussion with the clients, that can take place between you and your supervisor. Um, you know, I actually think all three, all, in, and on personal reflection, and I think all three are, are necessary to determine a client's readiness for a group. Uh, you know, considering the client's character, characteristics, needs, and preferences, would this be 
um, appropriate to put a client with um, severe behavioral issues in a group with individuals who don't have severe behavioral issues. You know, is that would that gel well? You know, these are things that we have to think about. And you know, we also have to be mindful that clients may need to move uh, to different groups as they progress through treatment, or as they encounter setbacks and relapses, and as they become more or less committed to addressing their problematic behavior. So let's talk about, uh, with regard to group membership, voluntary groups versus involuntary groups. Involuntary groups, uh, there is coercion into group involvement, which may result in an initial resistance. However, they actually may experience better outcomes overall. So when I'm talking about involuntary groups, I'm talking about groups that are mandated, that there are legal obligations, or that family or friends have pressured these individuals to join. Basically, any external motivating factor that can lead to clients resisting their, their wanting to be there and they're wanting to achieve any behavior change. Um, it is important to note that the self-motivation to change, so if you have a particular client who's really actually um, self-motivated to be there and you have a client who's you know, could care less and does not want to be there. By that individual witnessing the motivated individual really can inspire other group members and positively impact the group culture and norms. In contrast, voluntary groups are where, um, you know, group members ha make the choice and they want to be there on their own. They aren't being forced or coerced to be there. Group members often assist in providing motivation uh, to other members. Um, members certainly can serve as, a, you know, as effective mentors to other group members, and that goes for both groups, really. And certainly, when there are individuals who are highly motivated in the group, that can have a ripple, ripple effect to the other members. Uh, often, clients, off, um, clients often indicate primary mode of help is through mutual support. So in other words, you know, if you are the facilitator, take a step back. It's not the facilitator often that is most important that you know in creating change over the course of 12 sessions it's the folks that they're sitting alongside that the their peers that offer mutual support and you know we can often relate to that we want you know you want to see your classmates sitting in the same class with you you know you want to join coffee groups or book clubs or weight loss with folks who are like-minded and who are in similar situations with you you know the content helps and the facilitator helps but we also can't um, we have to I want to undermine the importance of peers in the group situations. Uh, those, in, those members in group settings who reported self-improvement were significantly more likely to have uh, certainly felt accepted by the other members um, and perceived similarity of some, some kind so that there were some similarities among the group membership. All right, so let's talk about um, self-help versus mutual help groups. There's a distinction. Self-help implies the individual in treatment is the main contributor to the process. Mutual help means the individual also assume partial responsibility for the recovery of their peers. As facilitators, we are responsible for establishing parameters for the group, providing general behavioral expectations, and clarifying the purpose of the group. And that honestly probably pretty much happens at every group. Uh, even if it's a closed group and it's group number nine and you have a core group of individuals who are going to be there for the duration of the of the remainder of the sessions. I mean this this kind of happens at, a, at the beginning of every session. And you may not even be the one actually reminding individuals of that. By group eight or nine you might have individuals who would volunteer to take the lead in establishing the reminding folks of the parameters of the group, reminding folks of the general behavior expectations, and reminding folks of the purpose of the group. And I, I want to just sort of add this. Instead of using the term group guidelines or very often group rules or rules of agreement, I, I, we've, I've seen that a lot, um, it was recommended to me to try using group values, and that's a more indigenous way of looking at this. Um, 
rather than refer to them as group rules, we can refer to them as group values. And really incorporating client suggestions into the group values sets a different tone. Um, it sets a different tone, tone for the group, and I think it's more... Um, it creates a more sort of supportive and strengths-based environment for individuals. Certainly, we try not to make group values too complicated or too restrictive. Um, focus on member safety, really, the honesty and the integrity and respect for for each other and for each self. Certainly, there might be a need to focus on punctuality, beginning on time and ending on. Excuse me, ending on time. And looking at values clarification, asking, what do I mean by establishing some parameters for the group? Why do we want this for our group? Maybe posing that question to the other individuals. And certainly, even if it's group 11 and you have one more to go, you might need to add, adjust, or change those group rules. And again, reviewing at each meeting is probably most likely going to be necessary. Maybe not but may, most likely. Here are some examples of group values. So respecting confidentiality. Um, this, this is something that I even do, I didn't do today for today's presentation, but very often when I'm presenting at conferences or delivering workshops um, in person, I will at the top of, at the beginning of the, the meeting, ask folks to, by a show of hands, I, I, please, I'm asking if you agree that we can keep confidentiality in the room, that individuals sometimes often might disclose personal information about their HIV status, about their drug use, about their sexual behaviors. And by a show of hands, can we all agree that what stay, what's said in the room stays in the room? So respecting confidentiality is critical, particularly in Indian country. Um, we work very often with small communities, as you know, and you know, gossip can be a challenge, and lack of confidentiality can be a challenge, or a perception of lack of confidentiality can be a challenge. So it's important to really underscore, I want to underscore this um, respect and confidentiality value so that you know that it's important, particularly when you're working with Native clients. Um, another example is non-judgmental acceptance of others. So let's not judge others for what they say, do, or where they've been. Are where they are. Certainly another example is willingness to self-disclose. That takes risk. That takes a uh, level of courage to talk about the issues that you're facing. We want to encourage participation by all group membership, by all group members, excuse me. And I don't, and that doesn't necessarily always mean speaking up or raising your hand or, or answering or offering answers to at every turn um, during the group. But, you know, there's other ways folks can participate. Active listening leaning in if they're engaged. You know, it might take a while for someone to warm up before they feel comfortable to share. I mean, but they're still participating. Um, recognizing the available support in the group, um, respecting others and willingness to accept feedback. These are just examples. So when, by implementing groups, by providing initial over, overview, both individually in the group, Clients will then come to the group with appropriate expectations. And what I mean by that is, if you are seeing clients individual, individual, in, individually, individually, <laughs> if you are seeing clients one-on-one, -on -one, and you also know of a group that's currently running and you think they'd be a good fit, talking about talking individually with the client about the group and letting them process if this might be a good fit, and then also, they have an opportunity to listen from the group facilitator what the group is about. You know, there's they can then have appropriate expectations of, of what the experience will be like. And certainly, clinicians and clients can expect a greater degree of success. All right. So there are different um, phases of groups when we implement groups. Certainly, the first phase is the forming stage. As the group is being formed, there is certainly apprehension on part of both the leader and the group members. Clients may not be sure if, they, if this is the appropriate group for them. You know, they might be a little uh, nervous about sort of being outed in a way um, among other members. You know, there just might be some sort of fear, and it might be helpful to draw out natural strengths as they 
may not realize they have. So going back to that individual one-on-one check-in around, if you're talking with your client and you're thinking they might be ready for a group work, reminding them that they they're, they have a natural strength that they've sought help and that they've remained your client and they've they've participated along the way. And, you know, pointing that out to folks is helpful, I think. And the next phase when we implement groups is the storming phase. And this may be a comfortable place for clients to have conflict, um, to voice conflict between other members. Um, so when that happens, it's not, or even conflict towards you as the facilitator. They might feel comfortable enough to start voicing um, disagreements. And, you know, as a facilitator, if you're a new facilitator, that might come across as you might, it might trip you up. It might, it, it, it might kind of throw you off balance. But actually look at that as a good thing. Look at that as a positive sign that actually folks are buying in and feeling comfortable enough to, to speak up. Um, we might help individuals by rephrasing something in a respectful way. And as I said, they may also question your role as a facilitator. Don't take that as a bad sign that you are a bad group facilitator, that you're a bad clinician, that you, um, you know, forever do not like running groups. No, take it as a good sign. Conflict can assist in bringing the group members together. Conflict may indicate that someone cares enough to be concerned. If someone is questioning your le leadership or wondering where the group is going, you know you have moved on from the forming stage. All right, next is the norming stage. Certainly will happen after the storm. A period of evenness and calm prevails. Then we move into the performing stage. Everyone knows their roles and the rules of the group and now motors along towards achieving its task. And the adjourning phase. When you are going to know when you are going to know the group is done. When do you know when the group is done? Facilita facilitators decide instead of clients getting bored. Um, that that that's a little vague. And um, by that I mean, if we're having open groups or if we're having groups that run, uh, so I'm trying to think of how I want to phrase this. In my experience, I've ran two different two different types of groups. Some that had a certain amount of sessions that only ran for 12 sessions that often were closed after the third. So people show up, by the fourth session we close it and we run, we run until session number 12 and we end. Then there's another level of groups where it just runs until you know people stop coming. I, I often, no matter whatever set it, setting, the best way to end a group really is to plan for the finish at the beginning. And by that I mean at the start of the group, maybe even a step before that when you're individually assessing and screening if someone's ready for a group and they want to join, talking about then and there the end. So you're already planning for the end at the very beginning. And the reason why I think that is important is because you may, you may not get the chance to terminate and close the group process with an individual because they may voluntarily drop out and you may not get and you may never see them again and you may never get to share those closing thoughts with them and so I do it up at the front and it it also adds a level of transparency on your role as a clinician so again the best way to end a group is to plan for it at the beginning particularly for native clients or folks who um, are marginalized or vulnerable, have been through systems, have maybe felt overwhelmed and, and disengaged and disenchanted from systems. Remember, you as a facilitator represent the system, the bureaucracy. Um, so I think by planning for the end at the beginning, you are you're setting expectations and you're facil you're you're fulfilling your role as a as a competent facilitator. Okay. I think I've underscored that enough. As you can see on the slide, I'm not going to go through this, but I want you to look at the different stages of group development and leadership roles. So everything we just talked about, um, you know, on the left you can see the forming, storming, and norming 
and on the next slide it, it shows the other stages. But take a look at the leadership tasks, which is the third column over. This gives you a, this will sort of, it's kind of like a, a little mini script or prompt of where you should be in each group stage. By the way, we're happy to share this slide set. Um, it will be made available after the fact. Uh, my email will be provided at the end. You can always email me for a copy of this and certainly reach out to Lena and Kate at the at the ATTC. They can certainly provide a copy of this as well. Again, here are the performing and adjourning uh, phases of the group and you can see the different leadership tasks that are associated with, with the different group, uh, the different phases. All right, in creating the group, remember that in most cases you are the single common element among the group members. In shaping the group, your experience and behavior, as well as the expectations of group members, will guide the formation of norms. In maintaining the group, your function as a, as a mediator, as a facilitator, handling issues that might arise which threaten group cohesion. Your job is to help the group function properly by showing confidence in your abilities, remaining calm and objective, and by providing a safe environment. Um, I, it's, I think when I first started doing groups, you know, there's certainly the unknown of who's going to be in the group, will they get along, will people um, cause problems for me as a facilitator, I mean those are all very normal questions. Um, and I think the only way to really learn and feel confident is by doing, right? And that goes for any new skill that we're learning in life. So, you know, if you can remain calm and objective, and certainly, I, I don't think I mentioned this in this presentation, but the help of, of your colleagues and your certainly the help and the critical need for a clinical supervisor or some level of supervision is, is essential to being a good facilitator. Um, we I, we do talk about co-facilitation, which I'll get into a little bit. But if you have the opportunity to, to be a co-facilitator and sit back and and let a seasoned clinician lead a group and watch and learn, that's golden. That's how you're really going to learn how it's done and 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 feel more confident in your role. Okay, so there are some common tasks of group facilitators. As you can see, I'm. I'm interchanging between facilitator, between group leader, between clinician, because to me they're they're relatively all the same, and I'm just mixing up, um, just to kind of mix it up. So, common tasks of a group facilitator certainly is to maintain a safe environment. If somebody is causing problems, if somebody is threatening you or other members, um, they need to be removed from the group immediately. Um, serve as a group historian, so. As I had mentioned in the example earlier, if by group seven it looks like an entirely different group than it did at group one, you're going to summarize where this process has been and where what process has unfolded and where we are today at group group seven. Certainly help clients remain in the here and now by redirecting or bringing them back to the purpose of the group. This is pretty typical in um, drug and alcohol groups where folks want to tell you know, their war stories or their stories from the trenches of what it was like when they were using. And that's important information to share. Don't get me wrong. But at a certain point, you may need to redirect or bring them back to the purpose of the group because the topic can get off hand fairly quickly. Certainly a common task for you as a group facilitator is to help clients discover answers from themselves. Your job is not to help, not to solve their problems, not to tell them what to do, and that's Counseling 101. And I think we forget, it's okay to have fun. Having a sense of humor helps, can break the ice, certainly. You know, but certainly use your professional judgment. Uh, we talked about war stories, and if you can redirect, redirect, uh, redirect re, excuse me, if you can redirect group members and get group members to a place where they start saying I statements, you know you're doing a good job. Um, so think about in examples when you're in meetings and people make blanket, blanket, blanket statements of other individuals like we or our experience or I saw so-and-so do this, that, and the other. 
redirecting them to saying I statements and keeping it on themselves and talking about their own experience. And you, at, you get to a point where you don't have to do that anymore. You know you're in a good place. All right. Let's talk about roles between a facilitator and a co-facilitator. And again, let me also just point out, this is a general, broad overview of things that I've learned along the way and things that clinical training that I've received in the past. Take with it what you want. You know, Use what's helpful. If something doesn't make sense or doesn't apply to your situation, obviously adapt it for your own situation. Um, but these are just some general things that I've picked up along the way. Certainly the facilitator is always prepared, like a Boy Scout, right? Is always ready. Be prepared. Facilitators is responsible for all consent forms, sign-in sheets, and other data that needs to be collected. Um, for example, today's webinar, Lena pointed out that the, at the end there's a GIPRA survey monkey that we would all love if you complete. And you know, she's in charge she's in charge of that, and she made it a point to point that out. So um, that's a role of a facilitator. Certainly greeting and welcoming each participant. Um, I like to do this as folks trickle in in the room. You can do one big greeting and welcoming at the start of the group. Certainly your role is to guide discussion, manage participation, thanking participants is critical, helping clean up and certainly completing the debrief process if there's a co-facilitator. You and the co-facilitator might take an extra 10, 15, 30 minutes after the group and talk about what happened and share experiences and um, address any issues that might have come up and how you know that can be prevented from happening again in the future. The co-facilitator, um, I if you're running a group and chairs are in a circle, avoid sitting side by side. That can look very authoritative and confrontational. Um, I prefer to sit directly across from the other facilitator to maintain eye contact if necessary. Um, the co-facilitator can certainly be in charge of handling nonverbal cues, watching the room, scanning the room, you know, picking up on stuff that maybe the facilitator might be too busy to, to be aware of. Co-facilitator can certainly handle um, helping folks sign in, adjusting room temperature, Halfway through, it gets super hot. They can um, open a door, turn on the air, turn on a fan. Um, if there's a knock in the middle of the of the group, they can jump up and handle who's ever at the door, etc. They can help monitor time, certainly help clean up and participate in the debrief, debrief process. All right, so let's take and look at working at group work with working with native clients. Certainly, it can be very different um, with regard to native communication styles. It can be very different in Indian country. Communication styles for native clients cannot be generalized. We, we know that because of the sheer diversity among native and indigenous people. However, however, it is an important concept to discuss when working to improve your ability to work with native individuals. For some native nations, tribes, and communities, um, if a native person looks away, this might be a sign of respect. And Native people are sometimes taught that listening rather than speaking immediately is important. And personal information about oneself and one's family is not easily shared. So you might have some initial resistance by probably maybe even up to group three. Folks may be reluctant to participate. It may actually be when the group closes that folks might feel more relaxed and more comfortable in sharing. Silence or minimal sharing should not be interpreted as disinterest or an indication that something is wrong. Where English is the client's second language, the speech may be thoughtful and slower. And some Native folks, um, particularly elders, may believe that talking about a topic might will it to come true. Um, I've ran into this situation, and I kind of almost think that this might be addressed in the pre one-on-one -on -one individual even before the client decides to join the group. I think that might be something that might be discussed and processed before they even join the group. But you, this may come up during the group. Um, 
And it may require, if it does come up during the group, say during group session number six, you might have to have an individual one-on-one -on -one check in and process that out. So there are some cultural considerations, um, particularly if you're new to working with Indian folks. Um, you know that different indigenous individuals identify differently. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that, but here are some different ways individuals might self-identify. They might identify as Indian, they might identify as Native American or American Indian, et cetera, et cetera. Part of that inlay is to, the, again, the sheer diversity of Native folks um, in the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. Over 562 federally different, fairly recognized tribes in the lower 48 states, excuse me, over 223 tribal communities and in Alaska and with the Hawaiian Islands. That's a lot of different folks, a lot of different communities. So how do we marry that, given these cultural considerations, with the clinical experience? And by the clinical experience, I mean the biopsychosocial and spiritual. The clinical experience you know, builds upon and fosters positive therapeutic relationships. In other words, thinking about your group members and about you, and how do we take these cultural considerations and, and, and tie it all together? Um, you as a facilitator, I believe, have a critical role in building trust. And I say this in almost every presentation I give around um, for talking about how to work with Native folks. Building trust is, is really, and this goes back to the confidentiality discussion earlier, I, I think is probably the foundation of all your work. Um, and not just with Native clients, with non-Native clients too. Building trust is critical and to your success as a clinician. It certainly increases the likelihood of treatment plan adherence and reduces client attrition. So in other words, it keeps them coming back. When you build that relationship, when you build that connection, when you build that trust, that's, that's where the real work, real work begins. Building that trust certainly reaffirms clients as experts in their own experiences, whether it be their health, their mental health, their behavioral health, their spiritual health. Um, building, it reaffirms them, it's just a reminder that they are the experts in their experience and that um, it sends that message to them. And in doing so, it helps clients make positive changes in their own lives, so it increases their motivation. So given cultural considerations, how does this fit within Native worldviews? So most often, it does require, um, to effectively work with Native individuals requires a shift and the delivery of our services. How do we work from a culturally relative perspective? I mean, that's the golden question, right? How do we work from a culturally appropriate, um, a culturally relevant way? So let's talk about spirituality. Um, because I know in non-Native groups, it's almost as if this never comes up. In Native groups, I think this is a foundation piece. So it's often, it's often part of cultural teachings, um, both learned and ingrained within our communities. So ceremonies around death, ceremonies around pure births, ceremonies around puberty, um, that's all rooted in spirituality. And we know, and clients know, spirituality is part of a holistic approach to wellness. So for example, Native folks have an appreciation and respect for nature, environment, and other surroundings. And there's an appreciation and respect for our health, our bodies, mind, and our connection to our past, to our ancestors, to spirits. Um, that's all part of spirituality. And we can't necessarily tease that out if we're running a group with Native individuals in it. And I, I, I hate to bring the binary between Native and non-Native groups, but I've done both. And what I can say is in non-Native groups, you know, maybe this doesn't come up on the onset. We don't, maybe spirituality isn't a topic of conversation at the forefront. It's different when I've ran groups with Native individuals because at group one, right out the gate, at the top of the hour, there might be a prayer offered as a way to start the group. So it's just, I mean, I, I don't want to say night and day. I don't want to say it's 
a binary like this and the other, but in some ways it is. And I'm, I'm pointing that out just so that you are aware uh, moving forward. Certainly in my experience, there are taboo subjects, um, not always, but they, they have included HIV. Folks might be apprehensive of talking about HIV in a group setting, um, as opposed to, say, a diabetes support group. That might be, you might get 50 people show up for that group, whereas if you're running an HIV support group, you might get nobody showing up. Um, it, this is with regard to Native culture and Native communities. Um, certainly another taboo subject can be sexual behaviors, particularly if you're talking about lesbian, gay, and bisexual sexuality and sexual behaviors. That might be a challenge. If you're running an LGBT group, you might have fewer people show up than you would if you weren't. Um, to other taboo subjects certainly can be drug use. I mean, that's a very intimate topic, just like sexuality and sexual behaviors. One's drug use and drug using behaviors and drug practices, that's a very personal subject. So that just may be a taboo subject. Um, just be mindful that there are general issues, issues of uh, modesty and privacy, um, particularly if there's a mixed gender group you know, that can create some issues around communication. And modesty sh often shouldn't be construed with shyness. It doesn't equate with shyness. It might actually be an issue around respect and respecting others and respecting you as a facilitator. Certainly there can be other taboo subjects that are regional and tribal specific. Okay, so let's talk about some native specific cultural risk factors. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the lack of confidentiality, that folks may be hesitant and reluctant to even wanting to start a group or join a group, to participate in a group, you know, that's something that might have to be discussed up front, individual one-on-one. -on -one. You know, they're, they're, depending on what community you live in, certainly there may be a lack of social services in your community. Maybe this is the only group counseling that's offered, and there may not be other opportunities for folks to join other groups. Um, so that's a consideration, um, which could actually maybe even work in your favor. There may be limited access to comprehensive health care. So if folks are identifying a need and they, in the group discussion, and they say, well, I wish I had access to this, that, and the other, and maybe that doesn't even exist in your community, you know, how are you going to respond to that? Or how are other members going to respond to that? What's going to be the outcome of that discussion? You know, taking into consideration circular migration, um, folks in your group at the start may disappear and come back at the end. Maybe they had to return, if you're living in an urban area, maybe they had to return home to the reservation to take care of family. Um, so that is something to be mindful of. Certainly unresolved traumas, you know, that's, another foundation piece, whether it be historical trauma or otherwise. Folks carry a lot of trauma. We all carry a lot of trauma um, from just the history of, of Native people on this land. That's something to be mindful of. And just being mindful of general racism, homophobia, and fear of strangers, that's another consideration to be mindful of. But, you know, it's important to mind be reminded that you have the opportunity to provide culturally respectful, meaningful mental health services. And I could pull you all now and ask how many groups are being run that are culturally appropriate in the local native community that you're near. I mean, probably not very many. So you have this op golden opportunity to do so. There is a pervasive and ongoing need for native centric or culturally sensitive mental health services, period. Whether it's individual counseling group services, or what have you, Native-centric um, and culturally appropriate counseling services, group counseling services, you know, are limited. And you have the ability to know and understand trends and needs. That's a key role as a provider working with Indian folks. So if you're considering running a group or thinking about it, you know, consider that you and you're currently working with clients who, where there's a need or who might be open to joining a group, you know, you have, you're in a key position to, to think about that, consider doing it. Um, here's another slide on confidentiality. Uh, you know, 
again, it's not a, it, it can be an absolute barrier. It's important to talk about this. Certainly, there may have actually been breaches of confidentiality in the past. Talking about it up front and being honest about what they can expect and what you can what you can do to ensure the confidentiality is important. Okay, so let's talk about engagement using culture using culture as a way to help get the engagement process. And by that I mean, how do we make folks feel at ease, native folks feel at ease if they're first time group user? And that was a little joke. Uh, first time group member. So I think introductions are critically important. Um, reminding folks in the group that they are experts in their own experience. And the use of spirituality, again, an opening or closing prayer can be, if you are, if it's appropriate for you to do so, you know, you might be up, you might opt to do, to lead that. Someone in the group from the local community, if you're not from the local community and someone is from the local community, that's your primary source. There's an elder in the group. And again, you may have to lead it yourself if, that, if the group, you know, elects you to do so. Um, this is critic. This is especially hard for me to do. Um, <laughs> try it, and maybe it's hard for you too. But um, I had a colleague, Vicky Peterson, who um, who taught me this, and that it's the ten second rule, especially for elders. So let's practice. I'm going to ask, or just a generic question. I'm going to wait ten seconds, and let's see how long this deafening silence is. So tell me, everybody, uh, let's do a check-in. How is your day gone? How is your day going? OK, that was a kind of a quickish 10 seconds. That can feel like an eternity. If nobody's opting to respond, and you're in the front of the room and you're asking this question and it's dead silence, I'm going to challenge you to wait there as long as it takes for somebody to chime in and respond. Um, so that's the 10 second rule. Um, you certainly want to have a referral list, if possible, of local native organizations and other resources in the community. And, you know, it's also helpful if you show up for other native events in the community. If you participate in community events, um, it's a two-way street. And we uh, we did a we were we did a research project um, when I was working in Denver with the local Denver Indian community, and it was a we were it was a research project. So we asked them, you know, they were coming to our office to for for weekly group meetings to talk about what it would take for folks to get involved in HIV clinical trials. And, you know, we were uh, with our focus groups. And one of the things that came up loudly was that, you know, this idea of this, was, I'm paraphrasing what the message from the community was, was that, you know, the, the researchers expect us to come to their hospital or their clinic so that we can participate in their activities. But we never see them come to our powwows or our community events or um, pay for a booth at our local health and wellness conferences. We never see them show step foot on our in our events. And so I, I bring that up because it's important to consider your your part of the community too, and that by showing face and by participating in these events, that's another way you're building trust and building connections and building a relationship. So think about. It. Also, having snacks and water on hand, healthy snacks and water possible, and incentives. Incentives, incentives, incentives are a great way to get folks engaged in the process. Now, there can be this pushback around incentives. Um, I've been blatantly told by funders that um, why, why would we want to pay for folks to come for an HIV test when they should want to take charge of their own health. I mean, that's the, the like literally what has been told to me when I've advocated and said, no, you, it's important to have incentives. And I've been told, no, we don't want to pay for incentives because um, folks should feel empowered enough to take charge of their own care. Well, OK, the literature, the research literature speaks to um, incentives. Like, 
it asks the question, is the client seeking services only for incentives or is the client personally motivated and the incentives is just a cherry on top? I, I don't really care what that says. I, I can't, I'm coming from a place of that I think incentives are necessary and as long as the client is showing up, even if it's just to get that $10 Walmart gift card or that $10 gas card or maybe that even that hot lunch you're providing or that brown bag lunch or that bag of snacks, whatever the case may be. As long as that individual is showing up for the services, you have a golden opportunity to engage and build trust, period. And that may be what it takes to get them in the door. No matter what, um, I think it's an essential component. And that's my personal and professional opinion. Okay, so let's talk about native retention strategies, um, building relationships with community leaders. Um, and this is kind of different, you know, if you're working in native communities versus non-native communities. This is more of a critical step, I think, if you're working in native communities. It's certainly consistency, your consistency is vital when building these relationships. Um, if you schedule a meeting with a community leader to talk about your new group that's forming, show up. Be prepared to inform them of your program, uh, of the program, the intent, and its progress. And give ample time for them to process information and ask questions. Again, the 10-second rule. So building relationship with community leaders, whether it be tribal leaders, whether it be tribal police, whether it be other tribal health care providers, um, you know, being consistent is, is a critical element to that. Getting local organization support. Certainly getting, you know, pounding the payment, going out and, and meeting face to face, engaging in small chat. Forget phone calls, emails, and faxes when you're trying to get local support. Go out into the community and build those relationships that are so important that I've been talking about. Um, you know, if it's a if it's a new organization and you're not familiar, if you don't have a if you don't know somebody there already, you know, start at the top, be respectful. And, and work your way down the list if they don't respond. Um, and be mindful that it may take multiple attempts. And that's OK. That's OK. Again, with regard to native retention strategies, integrating cultural projects such as cultural dancing, beadwork, shawl making, and cooking traditional foods um, certainly can be great ways to build a therapeutic relationship build trust, build connection, and the knowledge, and cultural knowledge. Um, one time in, once I was running a group, a beating group actually, in Santa Barbara for the local native community there. And the weekly beating group was an awesome opportunity for community members to come together, to work on a cultural activity, to talk about, you know, the pros and cons of their week. And it wasn't, so clinical, it wasn't like a clinical, we're going to have a closed group, 12 sessions, psychoeducational group, what have you. It was an opportunity for folks to come together and to build, build community. What could be better, right? It's really taking, that, that opportunity allowed me to take the professional um, out of the situation and create a more personal interaction and a more um, authentic, build a more authentic relationship with community members. Certainly, reminding clients of native-specific cultural strengths builds, remind, builds motivation, courage, and healing. So reminding folks that they have inherent cultural strengths that have been with them since time immemorial. I think native clients do not hear this information very often. However, I believe native people know these strengths. Maybe, maybe they just don't, aren't readily reminded of it, but they know them because they are demonstrated in our stories certainly among our leaders and through our ceremonies. And, you know, it just needs to be pointed out sometimes, reminded of and built upon. And here's a list of the strengths that I'm speaking of. Certainly, Native people are survivors. Native people have ancestors. They're resilient. They're adaptable. We're community-minded. There's that spirituality piece that can't be ignored. We have a connection to our past, certainly a connection to our family, elders, and our youth that we think of things holistically, um, that, you know, we have cultural pride, that, you know, we have access to um, our languages, 
maybe not all of tribal communities, but that there is a connection to a historic language, that there are foods and lands and ceremonies that are tribal specific. I mean, those are all strengths in that I think folks need to be reminded that those exist and they can tap into them, tap into them. And it should also be reminded that connection to these strength, strengths is a lifelong process, that you don't learn all this all at once and that you're good to go, that one's relationship to one's native identity is an ever unfolding and evolving process. And I think that's the beauty, beauty of it. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy morning to join me. Um, so thank you very much. And here's my email, my phone number. If you have issues or questions or if you want a copy of the presentation, I'm more than happy to share that with you. And I'll turn it over to Lena. Thank you. Thanks so much, Matt. I'm just going to pull up our final slides. OK, so if you have any questions, you can type them into the Q&A pod at this time or while I'm talking, and we can pass them on to Matt. Please stay online as we close out our webinar so you can be redirected to our survey. If the survey doesn't automatically pop up, please watch for my email follow-up as it will include the link to the survey as well as a link to the recording of this webinar. Please check out our other upcoming webinars in this series as well as our American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health series, which takes place on the first Wednesday of each month. We always welcome suggestions of topics or speakers, so feel free to make suggestions either in the question and answer pod or by contacting Kate Trams. Thanks again, Matt. It was really wonderful to have you. And if no one else has any questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.